thank you, Begonia, for this very, very uh, informed introduction to the politics of representation. And thank you for introducing me. Um, first, I just wanted to thank you all for coming here again and um, for, these two, for being here and putting this event together. I'm very happy, and it's the second uh, event we're organizing from the many movement tradition, and uh, it's now a tradition, because once you do it twice, it's a tradition. And we, <laughs> we hope to have a third one, and we will. <laughs> um, so my talk today is entitled Men's Gender Conscious Anti-Violence Activism, Moving Change, Tensions, and Resistances. As Begonia said, uh, I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Univ Open University of Catalonia, and my topic is uh, men's anti-violence activism, which can be called as well uh, pro-feminist engagement, pro-feminist mobilization. And from an ethnographic qualitative perspective, I'm looking at Spain and Italy. Um, so what's... Uh, what I'm looking at is practices and narratives of men that are involved in this kind of activism and, and representations intended in the, as the production of meaning and images is part of it is, but normally is not the core of my work. So today, because I'm in this panel called The Politics of Representations, I wanted to give uh, time to, to, and, and to give space to, to this. Um, so first of all, I wanted to say that one thing that I find uh, particularly interesting about men's mobilization for gender justice um, is ex actually the gathering of men politically, uh, which I intend as with the aim of critically approach reality and change for the better on the basis and starting from gender and masculinity. So this sounds very simple, but from an anthropological perspective, you have to start from the basic. So many men in the, in the field and, and activists call it speaking as men or starting from the position of being gender conscious. So masculinity or, or the gathering of men as men in its intersectional workings is where the critical attention is set and where transformation is advocated for. Jeff Hearn calls it men gender conscious activism and this is what makes it a form of masculinity politics. Considering its gender justice feminist orientation or pro-feminist orientation, then it's called a pro-feminist masculinity politics, as Connell would say. Um, constitutive to this mobilization is that its actors ask for a renegotiation of practices and imaginaries questioning their own position first, and the privilege that comes with embodying masculinity or a certain type of masculinity, so white, cisgender, straight, middle class, able-bodied, educated, and so forth. Um, in studying this social phenomenon, during my fieldwork, I've been observing and interacting with members of the networks of Masigalitaris, AIG, and Masquire Plurale, and many other groups. Uh, and as an anthropologist, I feel my attention drawn to this form of social gathering, which required a very interesting type of gender separatism. Uh, as male homosocial spaces and groupings not only already flourish in, this, in society in general, so, so as well real and virtual, uh, but also function as social locations where men can rene renegotiate and confirm their power among themselves, assuming that women do partake in this negotiation as exchange good of the male contract. So this is actually my argument and what I'm trying to say in my work. Uh, but the question is, what all this has to do with the politics of representation? I ask myself. So what I want to do here today is to move through possible answers or better move possible questions and reflections, keeping in mind not only the grassroots activism that I've been looking at um, in favor of gender justice, but also in general the field and the professionals working in that I had the chance to meet during different conferences, the events, and, and other initiatives that I had the chance to participate to. So what is the politics of representation has to do with this? First, I thought visibility. So visibility, so we can we actually elaborate on this a lot. And um, first of all, visibility as a key to any social mobilization. Uh, and even more, as Begonia just mentioned, in an image-driven society. 
and where social networks are the platform where uh, activism has been is being uh, performed much more nowadays. And of course, visibility is as social mobilization, as a key practice in social mobilization, is very much linked to the tradition of identity politics. But then, in the case of male pro-feminism, are we looking at an identity political movement or not? This is the very question. So, um, I'm going through a series of images here as, a, as an illustrative, as an illustration, as an illustri illustrative support in order to engage in some conversation and, and to raise questions about, again, the politics of representation and visibility and, and to the broad field of men engaging in gender justice campaigning and, and social media activism. So in the case of pro-feminist masculinity, it seems that by positioning as a man in favor of gender equality and making this claim visible, so producing images about this, could be something revolutionary per se. Probably because the expected subject of feminism are women, by default. Uh, and that apparently is sufficient to create a politically relevant action. Of course, this is a question, an open question. Uh, so here you can see some of the cases. So the, I think the, the first case I thought about was the, 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 the this, is, uh, this is what a feminist look like, selfie t-shirt. Or... Um, the campaign, the, the IHE campaign that was that ran through Spain, uh, social network campaign, hombres visibilizándose contra la violencia machista. So, um, all the question of visibilization, all the question of representation is super important porque linguistic <laughs> schizophrenia uh, is part of the richness of research. Footnote. Um, so then, hombres visibilizándose contra violencia machista in, in Spain has been the slogan, uh, and as well has been, an, uh, has been the slogan mobilizing men online. And the idea was to post selfies with uh, an image of themselves and a message. Very simple. So in this case, you can see, even with the hashtag. Um, Another, another very interesting case, as well on the same line, is Donem la cara contra la violencia mas, ma, masclistes. So again, it's the same idea. So posting selfies on oneself, and um, posting selfies, like putting yourself, exposing yourself as a man, but making sure that you're, that you're actually confirming that you are a man. So then it's the combination between masculine, be, between I'm, mas, I'm a normative masculinity or, or a type of masculinity that never engaged in some kind of gender-oriented activism, together with taking a stand against gender-based violence that seems already something political at stake there. Uh, all these cases use visibility as action, and visibility is used to make claims, as they say, to break the silence and the invisibility, and also to break the invisibility of non-questioning men's practices. Like, for example, Omas Igalitari's motto, a slogan, El silencio nos hace cómplices. So here's the willingness to distance from an order in which otherwise men would, just by being mad, be complicit with. Then there is a rhetoric question. Is this the trick of patriarchy? Um, so taking this action in this way seems brave and transformative in itself. And you can hear some critical stand on my, on my positioning. <laughs> anyway, this type of action based on representation and visibility as men against violence always brings from and to masculinity meanings and imaginaries where masculinity is at stake. So here you can see, for example, the case of this other uh, t-shirt, clothing, son un uomo que refuta la violenza. And, la, and the word uomo is, is made bigger. So in a case, what I see here is that, yes, it's political to take a stand as a man. And, and I, don't see it only, I don't see it only as political, but also there is something at stake for the subject themselves there. The need to reconfirm mascul uh, masculinity, in a way. Um, this selfie campaign seemed to work politically be because of the incorporation within the political statement of the speaking location of the actor himself as man. 
visibility stands on and cannot do without a claim to masculinity. This might resonate with the visual activist practices used by identity politics as to give visibility to minority groups and open up the room for speaking from and about those identities and bodies who are discriminated against. However, here's something different happening. Visibility is used in a different way, it seems so. Uh, there is a willingness to shift meanings uh, of normative masculinity and the meanings associated with this. Using, for example, new adjectives. Uh, we were talking before about labeling, new types of labeling. So caring masculinities, feminist masculinity, pro-feminist, engaged, anti-sexist, new, alternative, against violence, egalitarian, compassionate men. <laughs> yes, indeed, what's important is men. So it seems, it's, it's, it, well, what I feel is that it, a little bit feels like that there is a need to, there, there is a need to say that Yes, we are doing all this, we are alternative, we are engaging, we are pro-feminist, but we are still men. Um, <laughs> I would like to suggest that the shifting of meaning works as recentering the importance of staying men, as I said. So this reminds of the precarious status of masculinity itself as something always to be acquired and never sufficiently achieved to be constantly proven as a pivotal dynamic in the socio-cultural construction of manhood. Um, and it seems to work here as a re-emerging, re as engaging tool. So it actually, it, it does something, it's a something, it does move other men to engage in the movement, in the pro-feminist mobilization and sustaining the images that we are looking at. So here what I'm saying, it's even more evident, of course, it's like very uh, explicit. So real men don't buy girls. The claim to uh, a real ontological masculinity is there. And men is even put in a different color. Or what I said before, the t-shirt, this is what feminists look like. It's combined in this picture with the father and son that says, because real men treat women with respect. So the claim to a real masculinity is combined with feminist. And in this case, you can see even there is a uh, father-son bonding. So then we go back to, to, to what I said about homosocial bonding and relationship in shifting uh, normative, accept in, uh, normative and collective accepted norms in masculinity. Again, real men support women's rights and men of quality support gender equality, which is a little bit more sophisticated, I have to say still is the same logic. Uh, the, need to reinforce, the need of reinforcing masculinity at an ontological level is always present. Boys and men cannot do without the obligation to be a man, not even immobilizing. This is clear in the campaigns that appeal to real manhood and as mobilizing tool, here more or less made explicit. And it, seem, it, it, seems that we, it seems to say we are real men, we are still men. We are not less than men. There seems to be a sociocultural necessity for men to be always confident and reassured about their masculinity, the obligation of having to prove it, pro prove it daily against the threat of femininity, of course, of feminization, but from whom? By whom? By other men and other subjects who wants to acquire manhood status. Of course, the manhood status codified as a distance from femininity or in relation to women, because of course here is, again, because real men treat women with respect. So what is considered real men is uh, measured on the basis of how we treat women, or if we, whether we buy or not girls, depends where you stand. Um, these campaigns created by addressing different cultural contexts ask for and include a redefinition of values associated with normative masculinities. Not only where the explicit reconfiguration of a real man is like an axe as, but also affecting a network of meanings linked to what we consider accepted masculinity. Uh, so then there is also reconfiguration of what we think as strength, compassion, and other values so in this case, for example, we have other slogans and mottos 
because alpha males lead by example, not force. Um, and the second one, because real strength is compassion, not force. So in this case, we are not explicitly saying, um, we are not explicitly saying um, real men are pro-feminists, but there is a shifting in the meaning associated with masculinity, but still we, need, still we are alpha males. And still we need to have real strength. So we can see that there are elements that stay, that are not questionable, that change has to come with resistance somehow, tensions and contradictions, and different subjects need different discourses to speak uh, from and, and to speak to them, depending on the background values, so ethical, political, professional, depending on the imaginary of uh, militancy, for example, depending basically on what matters to them and speak to them as fathers, as religious persons, um, so what gives them meaning. Campaigns, therefore, needs an intersectional analysis to work and speak to different contexts and meaningful masculinity-related messages, and the analysis of these campaigns as well. How much time do I have left? Oh, that's okay. Ten minutes, at least. Ten minutes, okay. Yeah, well, so I hope so. Um, here we have other cases, other, other e examples of production of meanings and imaginaries where pro-feminist uh, action is taken and claims. What happens here is that men uh, joining, for example, white ribbon campaigns, anti-violence, uh, gender awareness campaigns, what they do here is that they dress up in women's clothes, or at least in the women's clothes that they use in their community. Um, so we have cases of the US white ribbon campaign, the famous example of um, a mile in air shoes, so men who put on women's shoes or at least high heels. Indeed, the motto here is real men wear heels in order to support gender justice and anti-violence action. And the, the, the other picture is from Varones Antipatriarcales, which is a group from Rosario in Argentina. And they, they were using a skirt in this action. And then you see actually their motto is ni macho ni facho. So they are questioning uh, machismo, they're questioning masculinity. And at the same time with an intersectional twist also uh, a political, uh, political stand associated with this. Um, interesting here is that by wearing women's clothes, it seems they are questioning a pivotal element in the social construction of masculinity in their community. So it seems that the obligation that masculinity needs to be constructed on the negation of femininity. So apart from the fact that I wear different clothes, because these kind of campaigns actually came up as well in India, in Iraq, in, in other places, so men were using the clothes that in their community are called as uh, feminine clothes. What is questioning here, it seems like um, that masculinity needs to be actually mm, constructed on the distance from femininity or the threat of being feminized. Again, what for me it's super interesting is that there is a man gathering, taking action as men, so where the, the, the meaning of gender is at stake again. And it's a, a group action, a collective action performed only by men. Or, yes. Okay, in this symbolic as well as practical effort in reconfiguring masculinities and their attributes collectively, um, they, we need to consider the, import, the importance of the imagining public and the need to be speaking to other men. So what I call an endogamic conversation, men to men, men among themselves to legitimize change and the authority of the discourse. And this especially is happening when the norms, norms in masculinity are being interrogated, questioned or reconfigured. So I suggest masculinity as a sticky networking activity among peers, like a sticky networking activity among peers, as almost social glue, where 
it has to be questioned, but at the same time used for rewriting the agreement among men, for rewriting relations and alliances among men, and to redefine the acceptable meaning of being men. This seems traversal to the campaigns that I've been showing you. So I've been showing you examples from different contexts, uh, from the US, from Spain, from Italy, and it seems to be transversal to, to these practices. Of course, there are also other campaigns that, are, that do not fit with this, but we are talking about this today. Um, connected with the, my argument of the necessary element of almost social glue for rewriting the agreement, uh, I would like to highlight the fact that, for example, in pro-feminist, among pro-feminist actors, frequently there is a need to advocate for role models. So to make visible, again, we go back to the question of visibility and the politics of representation, make visible um, men models. Again, visibility is used to gain acceptance of non-mainstream masculinities. And we need new role models as men, maybe to help avoiding the risk of losing grip with masculinity when it is questioned, and to know where we are staying within the correct norm and action as men. Probably because I was thinking, I mean, why female role, model cannot, role models cannot work for this purpose? So for example, in the field of gender justice in general, we have really a lot of female role models, and, and, but still from, from the perspective of uh, pro-feminist actors, there is, a quest, there is a quest and there need for searching for male role models. Mm. Probably because again, there is this endogamic conversation uh, commun to, the, to communicate men among other men, to communicate especially among activists, but uh, even more to communicate and engage men outside of the movement, outside of the gender justice conversation. So then who is the public of all of this again? The public is not neutral. Many, many times men, when taking this kind of selfies, or this, or this, who are they imagining as a public? This is very interesting. I have the impression uh, that again, the public can be other men. So then this seems again to remind us about the dynamic of change of men's practices under patriarchy. So then we are yes, shifting values, we are yes, uh, constructing new imaginaries or trying new labels, while using social dynamics that are already at work. I'm creating the tension now. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I guess you all know what is this. So, thank you, so I don't have to say this. Uh, I wanted to just say one thing about visibility and the privilege of representation. So, if we assume that men are already in a position of great visibility as men, we are confronted with a double tension. Pro-feminist men seem to be a minority or a protest masculinity. Um, in relation to the hegemonic masculinity, yet as men they enjoy great visibility and, pos and a positive public status in many cases. So politicians, academics, educators, speakers, and so forth. What happens, in, as in the case of the new Nameno, of the, the, this protest, is what my friend and colleague Joe Semelin called the immediate rock star effect. So then men taking action can happen that in some cases ha taking action in favor of gender justice, maybe in the same kind of logic that I was explaining at the beginning, just with the t-shirt, this is what feminists look like. 
there is um, the possibility of gaining status immedi uh, immediately. So what do we do with this? The issue stake is visibility as political and epistemic authority. So the location of Marx as masculine as a figurative speaking location in the shape here of images holds a visibility privilege because already has a voice in itself and a capital to be listened to. Again, there is a rhetoric within engaging men that says that men are best to talk men out of violence, for example. And I would like to say that it's a power that as, if, as any power brings with itself a responsibility. So what kind of responsibility is this? I would like to suggest the responsibility for men to use this power and privilege and visibility in a critical and affirmative way. Responsibility, therefore, as the being able to respond. So then the word key, the keyword is accountability. Accountability as gender justice work for everybody and by everybody, where everybody stands in a different intersection of power and privilege. Second, responsibility to bring feminism in male spaces and not men to occupying feminist spaces. Third, to take feminist reflection in their own experiences as much as possible, so to the personal level, to the micro practices. And then I would like to conclude that when it, this feels uncomfortable, is actually where it needs to be. It needs to stay and feel and work. We need to listen to this discomfort as a way to, to open up for new negotiations. Thank you.